Welcome back to another episode of What's Up Prof. Welcome, Walter. Welcome, Martin. <laughs> we're, we're privileged to have a sponsor specifying that we have to get new chairs and supplying us. Which is not an easy task in, in <laughs> the areas where we live, right? No. So just for information, it took us 1,200 and something kilometers to finally get two chairs that are alike. <laughs> Not too easy. It wasn't too easy. And just for everybody's information, these chairs are really comfortable. That's a problem because what if we fall asleep? <laughs> <laughs> and well, it's amazing. Your feet actually touch the ground. the ground. Yeah, no. And uh, your arms are not around your ears. <laughs> I don't know what we're going to do now. <laughs> no, so thank you. And I hope everybody will enjoy this just as much as we do. Yes, thank you very much. That's very kind. So we've got some important things to start off with. Let's open with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, thank you very much for everything you do for us. Lord, we need you in these discussions, and we ask that you bless us. We ask for the Holy Spirit's enlightenment and discernment that we can know what is right and what is not. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Martin, deception is the name of the game, isn't it? Definitely. Now, deception can look like the real thing. And... Uh, we are seeing so many things happening in the world and the arguments mm. that are always presented in favor of the events as they are taking place, or at least the moral issues, seem very convincing to some. But they are based on criteria which are not biblical. Mm -hmm. So there's a serious choice to be made. And the trouble is, that the media keeps bombarding you with this unidirectional mindset. No wonder the Bible says the whole world mm -hmm. wandered after the beast, received the same mindset. Yes. If you keep pushing that agenda and you say something long enough, eventually people think, well, that's the right thing to do, right? Correct. And it's important. It's the wonder with an O. So yes. it's an awe of, it's yes. gra taking up everything that the beast is telling them. Absolutely. So understanding Pope Francis is what we are calling the section. Mm. And there will be more than one Definitely. of these discussions because you cannot unravel it in one. It's impossible. But we've done the best we can <laughs> under the circumstances. Understanding Pope Francis, the Jesuit agenda. Why is it important to understand Pope Francis? Because, Martin, mm -hmm. within the Roman Catholic circles, there are many that don't understand him. Correct. They think he's a complete liberal. He's bringing in a liberal agenda. Mm -hmm. He's changing the face of the Roman Catholic Church. And they are complaining bitterly. And you know what's interesting? Mm -hmm that the Protestant world yes. looks at these conservative Catholics and says, see, the papacy has changed. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. Even they are complaining. Yes. So, all right, maybe he's going so liberal that even Protestants get a little bit shaky here and there and wonder what is going on. But the fact of the matter is they are changing and the general direction seems the one that everybody should go. Yes, and then you've also got the Protestant world that sees this change and now they can go into ecumenical council with us. Absolutely, because, you know, the papacy of the Middle Ages is gone. Mm -hmm. That Council of Trent papacy is gone. It doesn't exist. Well, that's what they... That's what they believe. Mm -hmm. But that's where the deception comes Correct. in. Correct. So... In order to make it absolutely clear, we are going to talk about this issue. If you understand the issues behind the scenes mm. and you start understanding where this Pope comes from, 
then you will see that nothing has changed. Correct. And it's falling into place. Yes, it is the chameleon at its best. Yeah, definitely. Hiding itself in the foliage and taking up the background so that you don't see it for what it is. So let's look at this issue of understanding Pope Francis. Here's an article from Reuters, May 25, 2021. Pope launches green initiative decrying predatory attitude towards the planet. Now, this is a, a relatively modern issue, mm -hmm. so people would think. But it's not. It's an issue that has been coming for a long time and we need to go to the root in order to see that we are now at the tip of the iceberg. Yes. Pope Francis launched an initiative on Tuesday to make Catholic institutions ranging from families to universities to businesses environmentally sustainable in seven years, saying a predatory attitude towards the planet must end. So he's given a seven-year period. Mm -hmm. Maybe he knows something. Okay. At a news conference announcing the initiative, Cardinal Peter Turkson, head of the Vatican Development Office, said the Pope has been invited to attend the United Nations Climate Change Conference, COP26, in November in Glasgow, Scotland. So there is a, a drive towards this COP26 conference. And we've spoken about yes. that before. So we're, we're not looking at that. We're mm -hmm. looking at the history and where this all comes from. So Turkson indicated that the Pope likely will attend. In a video message for the launch, the Pope said the initiative would be a seven-year journey that will see our communities committed in different ways to becoming totally sustainable in the spirit of integral ecology. That means you must be slotted in. Mm -hmm. There's no way that you can escape this, right? Correct. <laughs> now, he's setting the tune, isn't he? Yes. Okay. Taking the lead. The initiative will have focus groups, including families, parishes, dioceses, schools, universities, hospitals, and other health care facilities, businesses, lay Catholic organizations, and orders of priests and nuns. That's the whole spectrum. Mm -hmm. There's nothing excluded, right? No. That's talking about the Catholics, but it will definitely incorporate the whole world. The whole world. And it's always interesting how you start with the family unit, mm -hmm. because the papacy uses the family unit in order to push its Sunday agenda. Yes. Correct. And then it has the health message in there as well. Mm -hmm. So it has a right arm to its message. We've said that before. So since Laudato Si, praised be, was published in 2015, the Vatican and Catholic groups in the 1.3 billion member church around the world have taken many initiatives to reduce their carbon footprint. So this is the seven-year plan. Yes. Now it's really kicking in now because just the... La Dautu C year just expired now, and then Pope Francis came in. There was this seven year plan now. Martin, is he date setting? <laughs> this is a very dangerous trend. Yeah. Uh, the theologians must take note and say that date setting is not permissible. <laughs> <laughs> and what's also necessary to take note of, he was like we were saying, he's speaking of the of the Catholic Church there. But is Pope Francis really uh, just a Catholic churchman? Or is he a leader in the world? You see, some people say, <laughs> what is the matter what he says? He's just a church leader, right? But it's not the case. We need to understand this. So we are now going to look at an interview with John Kerry. Now, as you know, he's a Skull and Bones member. Mm -hmm. So he belongs to the secret societies. Uh, chapter 322 and all of these wonderful things that we've discussed uh, in many previous lectures. And what is his opinion of the position of the Pope in all of this? It's important that we get it from 
The most powerful nation in the world. Yes, like you said, an important leader in the most powerful country in the world. Correct, with a very powerful position. You're on a, a very important uh, mission here to Europe. Can you tell us why is it important to include a visit with the Pope during your visit to, to Europe to talk about climate change? Well, the Pope is one of the great voices uh, of reason and compelling moral authority on the subject of the climate crisis. He's been ahead of the curve. He's been a leader. His encyclical Laudato Si is really a very, very powerful document, uh, eloquent and morally very persuasive. And I think that um, his voice will be a very important voice leading up to and through the Glasgow conference. How can the United States as a superpower and the Holy See as a much smaller country, but nonetheless as a moral and spiritual authority, uh, collaborate in the fight against climate change? Well, the Holy Father is, one, if, if not the, one of the most powerful voices on the planet. And he's been uh, extraordinary in the eloquence of his uh, call on people to, to, to step up and be reasonable and to live out our responsibility as human beings in caring for God's creation. Um, and, and we all have to be stewards of that creation. That's his message. Uh, but because he is above politics and outside of the hurly-burly of day-to-day -day, um, uh, national uh, conflict, et cetera, I think he can sort of you know, shake people a little bit and bring them to the table with a better sense of our common obligation. And I think the Holy Father speaks with special authority to our sense of obligation to each other uh, and the ways in which uh, we need to all step up now together. Uh, given the divisions of the world and some of the polarization and uh, the ideology and conflict, um, that voice is more important than ever. Now, Martin, that is a very astounding interview, isn't it? Definitely. The setting under that picture, yes, showing all those popes, mm -hmm. and the interesting thing about those popes are they are the popes of Vatican II mainly, yes, right, mm -hmm. and he's he's towering above them. Yep, and the other thing is the most powerful, one of the most prominent, if not the most prominent voices in the world and he is going to be the moral voice of reason mm -hmm. it's interesting that the georgia guidestones talk about this age of reason right yep and we must stop being parasites on the planet so all of this is very very important and leading up to this cop 26 meeting in glasgow mm. So interesting things are lying ahead and therefore it is essential that we understand where this is coming from and what the mindset behind it is. Definitely. So Martin, it is essential that we also understand where the moral compass mm -hmm. of Pope Francis comes from. Yes, because like Kerry said, he's the moral leader Yes. So you have to know what type of morality are we talking exactly. about. Exactly. Now, they class themselves as a Christian institution, and we've had some WhatsApp profs about the doctrine of the serpent mm -hmm. in the past. People might want to Go take in. cognizance of those again. Mm -hmm. But the morality is not based upon the Word of God. No. The morality is based on something entirely different. Correct. It's a spirituality that has no connection to the Bible whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And we need to make this quite clear. So we need to go into the Jesuit roots and see where the morality comes from yes, and well, why it is such a dangerous morality. It's important to understand where Pope Francis comes from. Yes. 
Now, this comes from America, the Jesuit Review, YouTube channel. And the picture on the front is about Father Sosa's new book. He's, of course, the head of the Jesuit order. And he's saying, walking with Ignatius. In other words, this whole issue is Ignatius spirituality. Ignatius, the founder of the Jesuit order. And, of course, all Jesuits have to be steeped in Ignatian spirituality. Yes. So we need to know where that comes from. Mm -hmm. And Pope Francis, being a Jesuit, is also steeped in Ignatian spirituality. spirituality. All right, let's have a look at this. So we, we do have to ask, um, since you are the Superior General of the, of the Jesuits and Pope Francis is our first Jesuit pope, who's, who's in charge between the two of you? Do, you? do you report to him or does he report to you? He is the pope. <laughs> the pope. So it's very clear. But he's still a Jesuit. <laughs> Every Jesuit reports to the Pope. To the pope. Mm -hmm. and it is maybe to, to, to explain that when a Jesuit becomes a bishop, he, the obedience is not, more, is not anymore for the superiors of the society. No? Mm. The bishop depends on the Pope, and the Pope depends on himself, <laughs> on the spirit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, because as you maybe remember, Ignatio de Loyola used to call the Pope the vicar of Christ in earth. So he's the Pope. So <laughs> I, I can't go to him. <laughs> <laughs> so what is interesting uh, in this discussion, we will look at more of, of this discussion because there are very, very pertinent statements that are being made. So number one that is important in this section is that the Pope is dependent upon himself. Yes. He is the ultimate voice, the one who decides. Later on in the interview, he, he claims that he, as the Jesuit order's head, is the neck. <laughs> Which is a good analogy because uh, it'll say where it has to go. And sometimes a general, as we saw in Crete to Malta, have, yes. has to make his own decisions. And they all walk according to the drumbeat, right? Correct, correct. And that's how they organize the world. Maybe, maybe I can just add here, it's important if somebody doesn't know what you're talking about now, I'll put the link in to Cree to Malta, where they can go and watch. Um, where we're talking about the art of war. That's it. Correct. So perhaps that would be interesting to put that link in. So basically, we're looking at the structure generally, but we will continue. How being a Jesuit has shaped him as Pope? Uh, you know, he's somebody who talks a lot about discernment, which is a really important part of Jesuit spirituality. And... I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about, um, you know, what what we can all learn from Pope Francis about discernment. Pope Francis uh, is not only a Jesuit, he's a Christian. And discernment is, is part of Christianity. We are about to celebrate Pentecost in a few days. So we can renew our idea of uh, being guided by the Spirit. Discernment is the skill every Christian needs to be guided by the Holy Spirit. And that's why Ignatian spirituality is so pointed on that. And Ignatian spiritual exercises are a kind of discernment school mm -hmm. that he, he uh, learned in himself. So following the spiritual exercises, every person can be helped to hear the voice of God calling him to a fully human life and to decide to follow that voice, not to take to make an election. And, uh, mm -hmm. uh, and you can also maybe remember that the, the success of Ignatius with the spiritual exercises were among university students. He was mm -hmm. a university, an old university student and he get together with some young university students, all the first companions of Ignatius 
where university students gather by the experience of the spiritual exercises. So right. uh, the, this is school of discernment has been a very, uh, very fruitful for, for us in all the stage of our life and apostolate. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so all Jesuits do the spiritual exercises, but one thing that's always struck me, struck me about the society is the, the diverse directions that Jesuits go on from there. So you have Jesuits who are teachers, doctors, actors, podcasters, uh, everything you can think of. Um, and, you know, that's clearly part of the Jesuit charism and the strength of the order. Um, but as the person who's on top of that, at the neck, how do you how do you manage such a diverse workforce? Well, the fiddle of all, I every day I discover something new that yes, we are doing. <laughs> all right, very very important. The discernment comes through the spiritual exercises. Yes, correct. Mm -hmm. And the spiritual exercises of Loyola are the means whereby you connect to the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. to be informed and to receive discernment. Not the Word of God. No. Spiritual exercises. Mm -hmm. So that is very important. And then the other issue that he mentioned was to live a truly human life. Now, in Jesuit thinking and Jesuit theology, there is a book written by another Jesuit, which is called No Other Name? Mm -hmm. Question mark. Yes. So can you be saved by any other name than Jesus Christ? And then the answer, of course, in that book is, of course, you can be saved mm -hmm. in any religious system. Jesus Christ is not the only way. Sure. So gonna... that is very important. Mm -hmm. And he defines to be saved as living a truly human life. Yeah. That's very, very interesting. So to be saved to a Bible-believing person is to have this knowledge that Jesus Christ has paid the price for you, that through his atonement, through his blood, you by faith can be part of the kingdom of God. Not with them. No. Not according to them. It's a living a truly human life. Mm. In other words, everybody has to come onto a level where everybody lives happily on earth. That's the kingdom on earth. Yes. I'm not looking for a kingdom on earth. I can keep it. And this is linking in with this whole World Economic Forum plan of everybody owning nothing and being happy. Yes, and having the same basic income. Correct. Uh, so, very interesting. So, the spirituality, we need to understand where it comes from. Because people think that this spirituality, this discernment, being a Christian so-called mm. institution, comes from the Word of God. It doesn't. Yes. And that's important. It's very important because a lot of this sounds great. All right. So, now let's just go back in history and have a look at this from all of these perspectives. The reasons why the Jesuits are even there are very important. And I know we've pushed this agenda, but people forget. And the worst thing you can do is to have to repeat history because you forgot the history of the past. Yes, and it won't be necessary to repeat it if we could see that some people did not forget this. But what we see is that people did forget this. And then they join in ecumenical councils with them. Correct. Absolutely correct. So here is an, uh, a quote which is very relevant. I cannot too much impress upon the minds of my readers that the Jesuits, by their very calling, by the very essence of their institution, are bound to seek by every means, right or wrong, the destruction of Protestantism. This is the condition of their existence the duty they must fulfill, or cease to be Jesuits. Accordingly, we find them in this evil dilemma. Either the Jesuits fulfill the duties of their calling or not. 
In the first instance, they must be considered as the biggest enemies of the Protestant faith. In the second, as bad and unworthy priests. And in both cases, to therefore to be equally regarded with aversion and distrust. That's history. It comes from the history of the Jesuits. Mm. Their origin, progress, doctrine and design. Let's go to the great battle between the Catholic system where the Jesuits created to spearhead that battle mm. for the Catholics and Martin Luther. Martin Luther's appeal was to submit the conscience directly to God through the word. And Loyola's drive was to submit the conscience to the papacy. Ignatian spirituality was to be achieved through spiritual exercises by substituting imagination and encounter theology for the reality of faith. So the discernment that the Jesuit seeks comes through imagination and spiritual exercises. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand how it works. It's not word-based. No. And it's also necessary to understand this because they've Christianized this whole th um, imagination and encounter theology of them. Yes. So there's a lot. It's also infiltrated Protestant churches. Oh, Protestant churches run on spiritual exercises without knowing it. Yes. So uh, Ignatius Loyola and Martin Luther were, of course, contemporaries. Mm -hmm. Let's see what Martin Luther wrote. He wrote, The holy scriptures are full of divine gifts and virtues. The books of the heathen taught nothing of faith, hope, or charity. They present no idea of these things. They contemplate only the present and that which man, with the use of his material reason, can grasp and comprehend. Look not therein for aught of hope or trust in God. But see how the Psalms and the book of Job treat of faith, hope, resignation and prayer. In a word, the Holy Scripture is the highest and best of books, abounding in comfort under all afflictions and trials. It teaches us to see, to feel, to grasp and to comprehend faith, hope and charity, far otherwise than mere human reason can. And when evil oppresses us, it teaches us how these virtues throw light upon the darkness and how after this poor, miserable existence of ours on earth, there is another and eternal life. You see, Martin, how word-based mm -hmm. Martin Luther's thinking was. And he said that this human reason cannot even grasp the depth of divine reason. Mm. The Holy Scriptures surpass in efficaciousness all the arts and all the sciences of the philosophers and jurists. These, though good and necessary to life here below, are vain and of no effect as to what concerns the eternal life. The Bible should be regarded with wholly different eyes from those with which we view other productions. He who wholly renounces himself and relies not on mere human reason will make good progress in the scriptures. But the world comprehends them not. From ignorance of the most mortification which is the gift of God's word. Can he who understands not God's word understand God's works? This is manifest in Adam. He called his firstborn Cain, that is, possessor, house lord. This son, Adam and Eve thought, would be the man of God, the blessed seed that would crush the serpent's head. Afterwards, when Eve was with child again, they hoped to have a daughter, that their beloved son Cain might have a wife. But Eve, bearing again a son, called him Abel. That is vanity and nothingness, as much as to say, my hope is gone and I am deceived. This was an image of the world and of God's church, showing how things have ever gone. 
the ungodly Cain, was a great lord in the world, while Abel, that upright and pious man, was an outcast, subject and oppressed. But before God, the case was quite contrary. Cain was rejected of God, Abel accepted and received as God's beloved child. The like is daily seen here on earth, therefore let us not heed its doings. Ishmael's was also a fair name, hearer of God, while Isaac's was not. Esau's name means actor, the man that shall do the work. Jacob's was not. The name Absalom signifies father of peace. Such fair and glorious colors do the ungodly ever bear in this world, while in truth and deed they are condemners, scoffers, and rebels to the word of God. Martin, this mm. man had wow. insight, right? Yeah, it's amazing how he put it. It's amazing how he writes. But by that word, we, God be praised, are able to discern and know all such. For Martin Luther, discernment was learnt in the school yes. of the word. Mm -hmm. Therefore let us hold the Bible in precious esteem and diligently read it. To world wisdom, there seems no lighter or more easy art than divinity and the understanding of God's word so that the children of the world will be reputed fully versed in scripture and catechism, but they shoot far from the mark. I would give all my fingers, save three to write with, <laughs> could I find divinity so easily and light as they take it to be. The reason why men deem it so is that they become soon wearied and think they know enough of it. So we found it in the world, and so we must leave it. But in fine vidibatur curius toni, I have many times essayed thoroughly to investigate the Ten Commandments, but at the very outset, I am the Lord thy God. I stuck fast. That very one word, I, put me to the nonplus. He that has but one word of God before him and out of that word cannot make a sermon can never be a preacher. <laughs> I am well content that I know however little of what God's word is and take good heed not to murmur at my small knowledge. Now that was a long quote. Yeah, but it's beautiful. It has so much depth to it. And it tells you that your reason cannot fathom God. Yes, the way he said that the names, the biblical names that were uh, earth, earthly were the great ones. And it is like that to this day. Yes. So be careful of that great name. Eh? But this has to do with discernment mm -hmm. and spirituality. Where does it come from? What is the source? What is the root? Let's go to the other side and see where Ignatius Loyola's spirituality came from. Mm. Now this is an excellent source. This is Abinier's History of the Reformation of the 16th century. And it is written in that Inigo, which was a nickname for Ignatius, instead of feeling that his remorse was sent to drive him to the foot of the cross, persuaded himself that these inward reproaches proceeded not from God, but from the devil. And he resolved never more to think of his sins, to erase them from his memory and bury them in eternal oblivion. Luther turned towards Christ. Loyola only fell upon himself. Visions came ere long to confirm Inigo in the convictions at which he had arrived. Inigo did not seek truth in the Holy Scriptures, but imagined in their place immediate communication with the world of spirits. Luther, on taking his doctor's degree, had pledged his oath to the Holy Scripture. Loyola, at his time, bound himself to dreams and visions 
and chimerical apparitions became the principle of his life and his faith. In other words, Martin Luther also experienced remorse for his sins. Mm -hmm. And like Loyola and the Jesuit order, and like his customary in Catholic thinking, chastised himself. Mm. He beat himself. He fasted to the point of starvation. He slept on the hard ground without a blanket. He punished himself and he found no relief. Mm. And so eventually he discovered that relief in the scriptures. Inigo had the same experience. But he chose the path of imagined spirituality, mm. having immediate contact immediate with the other contact, world. Yeah. And it became a reality. Mm -hmm. The spirits actually spoke to him. Correct. And through the imagination, which is actually a form of self-hypnosis, mm -hmm. he entered into that other realm. And once you are in that realm, you are open to the spirit. But Martin, shouldn't you test the spirit? Correct. Against what? Against what? Mm -hmm. That is the question. Don't you have to have a standard and a norm whereby to test the spirit? Definitely. Now, if you cut out the scripture, mm -hmm. then what do you test the spirit by? By the next spirit? Correct. So if somebody has a spirit and that spirit coincides with the spirit that I have, is that a confirmation? For, for that person, yes. For that person, yes. Very dangerous. Yes, de no, definitely. And also, it says there, Lyhola only fell upon himself. That sounds similar to what the Jesuit general said. Exactly. Pope Francis has to fall back on himself. Himself and upon his spirituality. And that's where he gets the connection. So, Martin, in order to understand Pope Francis a little bit better, we need to look at his history and see how he developed within the Jesuit order and how his spirituality developed. So CNN actually did a little series on Pope Francis. And there's an article, Dark Night of the Soul, where they discuss his growth with, within the system. Mm. So let's have a look at some of those issues so that we can understand what we are dealing with. This is Córdoba, a city in the heart of Argentina. More than a million people live here, but in the 1990s this was a lonely place for the man who would become Pope Francis. Jorge Bergoglio, that's the Pope's name before he was Francis, used to live in Buenos Aires, where he had a reputation for being more a drill sergeant than a man of mercy. He would tell priests what to read, how to dress, even how to pray. Finally, the Jesuits decided they'd had enough. They sent him 500 miles away to Cordoba, basically hoping to get rid of him. So how did this man who was exiled not only become Pope, but become a rock star Pope? As His Holiness, Pope Francis has said, Diplomacy is the work of small steps. I want to thank and recognize the support of the Vatican, and especially Pope Francis, for the improvement of relationships between Cuba and the United States. I love this guy. Hola. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Mwah, Uriela. Javier and Sebastian are local journalists in Cordoba. Smells good. Who fed me well. and gave me their perspective on how the city changed the man. Por eso es que él dice que fue su tiempo de purificación interior porque lo vivió muy interiormente. Eh, tenía muy poco contacto con el exterior. You can hear the sadness in the Pope's own words. Ricardo Spinazzi was one of the Pope's closest friends. Estrella mi noche. He read me a poem that Francis wrote about being lost on a dark night with only the stars to keep him company. Noche al intemperie. 
Ricardo told me that if I really wanted to know what happened during the Pope's dark nights, I should talk to his spiritual son, Father Angel Rossi. How long have you been here? 18 years here. El Papa drinking a mate? That's a big mate. He looks happy. <laughs> it's beautiful. Come with. Yes. He took me to the chapel where the Pope prayed alone every morning. Rossi said that the Pope suffered terribly during his exile, and friends were actually worried about his mental health. De mi padre, él estuvo presente y uno se acercó, un, no un sacerdote, sino alguien que nos conoce los jesuitas, dijo, qué lástima este hombre que prometía tanto y ahora está enfermito, mal. Aquí vivió el Papa Francisco de junio de 1990. Wow. Father Rossi showed me the actual room where Francis lived. You would pray and write and read in here? Sí, yes. Very simple, very Very humble. In the end, it's not exactly clear what happened to Pope Francis during his exile in Cordoba. But he says that he came back more merciful and kinder. So it seems like whatever happened here clearly had a lasting impact on Pope Francis. So, Martin, there are some that claim that in that dark night he actually had similar experiences to those of Ignatius Loyola Mm -hmm. because he practiced those spiritual exercises. It is part of the program. Every Jesuit has to go through the spiritual exercises. And there he had this encounter theology. The inner inner spirituality, as the, it was mentioned in the video, that he had to discover. Yes, and as uh, the Jesuit general said, he was formed by the spiritual exercises. So this is where this contemplative religion formed him, mm. not the Word of God. Let's just look at some of the quotes regarding the spirituality and the Pope's Dark Night of the Soul. It takes more than a decade for Jesuits to complete their training, which includes theological and philosophical studies, hands-on ministry, and intense spiritual retreats. The idea is to train a company of men able to go anywhere and fulfill any mission, all for the greater glory of God. In actual fact, that greater glory is the greater glory of the Pope. Mm -hmm. Bergoglio, Pope Francis, was appointed provincial of the Argentine Jesuits when he was just 36. The Society of Jesus divides itself into geographical regions called provinces, which are led by provincials who serve six-year terms. After serving in high-powered posts like provincials, many Jesuits are demoted to discourage careerism and ambition, a sin that Ignatius called the mother of evils. But Swinon succeeded Bogolio as provincial and made his friend rector of the Collegio Maximo, a decision that would divide the province for decades. Even more troublesome for the province, his devotees honored Bogolio's every word as holy writ. And after holding high Jesuit office for 15 years, he had attracted a sizable entourage, perhaps 40% of the province. Finally, Bogolia's bosses decided they'd had enough. They shipped him off to Cordoba, 500 miles away. And now comes the essence. What happened to him there? Yes. So let's just make it quite plain again. He was basically exiled and demoted, right? Correct. But that's part of their training. Yes. So we shouldn't misunderstand that. Yes. It's part of the plan. It happens to all of them. And also, just for interest's sake, this dark night of the soul was actually a poem that was written by St. John of the Cross, also a Catholic, but a mystic. Absolutely. So you get all sorts of uh, intertwining nuances interesting nuances yes all right so what did he do in those time periods when he was away drawing on the spiritual exercises 
the set of prayers and contemplations he learned decades before as a Jesuit novice. He explores the difference between self-pity and self-sacrifice. The Reverend Angel Rossi, a man Pope Francis refers to as his spiritual son, describes Pope Francis as follows. He's humble but confident, a disciplined rule breaker. He's deeply spiritual but crafty, a cross between a desert saint and a shrewd politician. He's a man of power and action who spends a great deal of time in prayer and contemplation. It is a description many Jesuits might recognize in themselves. Contradiction is part of who we are, Rossi said. This is part of the training. So in this contemplation, which is what Ignatius taught them mm -hmm. and which he experienced, they find their spirituality mm -hmm. and their reason yes. and their discernment. All right, here is another Jesuit uh, who will explain this issue. The Jesuit spirituality of Pope Francis. As Jesuits, Pope Francis and I have much in common. We have been formed, so to speak, by the same spirituality during long years of Jesuit training as well as in the years since then. In what follows, I reflect from the inside on some of the key characteristics of Jesuit spirituality in terms of the insight they can provide into the world's first Jesuit pope. A sinner called to be a companion in Christ's mission, central to every Jesuit, is the experience of the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, who founded the Society of Jesus, alternatively known as the Jesuits. Every Jesuit does the full 30-day exercises at the start and at the end of his training, and also usually a shorter version of these exercises annually. Finding God in everyone and everywhere. That's interesting, right? That's really interesting. Yes. Finding Him everywhere. That is pantheism. Yes. In many ways, it is almost like certain f forms of Buddhism. Yes. Where you eventually fuse and become part of the divine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is a very occult experience. A second characteristic of Jesuit spirituality is its emphasis on being able to find God in all people, in all places, and in all things. That's pantheism. Mm. And in a higher sense, panentheism, which allows for a personal side of God. Yes. Francis was the master of Jesuit novices, to use the traditional title in Argentina when he was a young man. So he trained them. Yes. That's he, what he did. He led out uh, retreats and all of it. In this role, he had to be able to give the spiritual exercises to those considering becoming Jesuits, which meant that he had to know the exercises very well. The characteristic of finding God present in everyone and everywhere also makes Jesuit spirituality world-embracing, open to people of other religious traditions and none. So that's why they can incorporate atheists or yes. pantheists or any system, shamans, anything. Arms are wide open to receive all of these. And open to seeing goodwill in everyone. Francis is well known for this openness. And then the discernment. My emphasis on how Jesuit spirituality is at work in Francis makes us aware that while he is clearly an admirer of Francis of Assisi and inspired by him, he is nevertheless, I would say, first and foremost a follower of St. Ignatius. And he is in no doubt about that himself. Returning from Brazil, he said the following in his unscripted interview with the journalists on the plane traveling with him. So now let's look at his own words. I feel myself a Jesuit in my spirituality, in the spirituality of the exercises, 
the spirituality I have in my heart. I feel so much like this that in three days I'll go to celebrate with Jesuits the feast of St. Ignatius. I will say the morning mass. I haven't changed my spirituality. No. Francis, Franciscan, no. I feel myself a Jesuit and I think like a Jesuit. I think, Martin, that should make it pretty clear mm -hmm. to the listeners that Francis is steeped in the spiritual exercises of Loyola. Correct. They are his norm, they are his standard, they are his guide, they are his source of discernment. I yeah. think it is important that we just briefly go back in history and just look at what the spiritual exercises actually entail. Definitely. That's most important because now we've said he is steeped in those spirituality and those exercises. Now, but a lot of people might not know what it entails. Exactly. And it's very important that we know why. Because this is not only going to concern Pope Francis. Mm. It's going to concern the whole world. The whole world, yes. Because this discernment, this spirituality is what has to be superimposed upon the whole of humanity, including you and me. Mm -hmm. I refuse to be part of it. Because like Martin Luther, I will take my stand on the word and that's where my discernment and my spirituality must come from. Correct. So this here is... Uh, Information from the Spiritual Exercises of St. Ignatius Loyola, translated from the autograph by Father Elder Mullen, Society of Jesus, New York. So this is how it worked. Let's go back and see what he did. The call of the temporal king. It helps to contemplate the life of the king eternal. Now here you have the first basic premise. You don't go directly to that eternal king, you go to the temporal king. In other words, you make a human being your example. And this is where the Pope comes in. He takes the place. Mm. He is the vicar of Christ on earth. He takes the place of Jesus Christ. And if that spirituality that comes from there is contemplative, then that is what you receive then you have bypassed mm. Jesus Christ. So, it starts with a prayer. Let the preparatory prayer be the usual one. First prelude. The first prelude is a composition, seeing the place. It will be here to see with the sight of the imagination, the synagogue, the villages, the towns through which Christ our Lord preached. So you now in your imagination mm -hmm. are going into the scene. Visualization. Visualization. Then the second prelude. The second to ask for the grace which I want. First point. The first point is to put before me a human king chosen by God our Lord whom all Christian princes and men revere and obey. Immediately Christ is sidelined. Yep. He's substituted. Mm. Second point. The second to look how this king speaks to all his people, saying, It is my will to conquer all the land of unbelievers. Therefore, whoever would like to come with me to be content to eat as I and also to drink and dress, etc., as I, likewise he is to labor like me in the day and watch in the night, etc., so that afterwards he may have part with me in the victory, as he has had it in the labors. There goes your individuality. You've just sacrificed it. Correct. Third point. The third to consider what the good subjects are or to answer. Fourth rule. To praise much religious orders, virginity, continence, and not so much marriage as any of these. So if you want to be a Jesuit, you have to get rid of everything that is normal and natural for humanity that God has placed within humanity. 
You have to cut off your natural feelings. You have to cut off your natural emotions. You have to cut off your natural attractions. And you have to separate them from your life. Because they get in the way, Martin, mm. of your one goal. The fifth rule, to praise vows of religion, of obedience, of poverty, of chastity, and of other perfections of supererogation. In other words, you have to go through all of these motions and all of these fasts and all of these things and all of these vows and not the Word of God. You don't contemplate God. You mm. contemplate the system. Sixth rule, to praise the relics of the saints. Mm. Now, excuse me, Martin, isn't that against the second commandment? Yes, that's... Idolization. Isn't that one of the reasons why Rome had to remove that commandment? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, to praise the relics of the saints, you're not allowed to worship anything. Not above the earth, not under the earth. Nothing that is dead. Yeah. Do not be defiled by the dead, says the Bible. They do exactly the opposite. Give in that, in that um, article, Dark Knight of the Soul, it also mentions there that in that chapel, where Pope Francis used to pray. He was praying there, and there was a lot of Jesuit relics in the chapel. So to praise the relics of the saints, giving veneration to them, that's contrary to the word of God. And praying to the saints, you were not allowed to consult the dead. And to praise stations, pilgrimages, indulgences, pardons, crusades, Candles lighted in the churches. Martin, do you find that anywhere in the scriptures? No. Seventh rule, to praise constitutions about fasts and abstinence, as of Lent, Ember Days, Vigils, Friday and Saturday, likewise penances, not only interior but also exterior. That means you had to chastise yourself physically. Beat yourself. Is that biblical? No. Wasn't Christ treated as we deserve so that we might be treated as he deserves? Yes. The eighth rule is to praise the ornaments and the buildings of the churches. What is that, Martin? Idolatry. Correct. Likewise, images and to venerate them according to what they represent. To have the true sentiment which we ought to have in the church militant, let the following rules be observed. First rule, the first, all judgment laid aside. We ought to have our mind ready and prompt to obey in all the true spouse of Christ our Lord, which is our holy mother, the church hierarchical. So that's the first rule. You may have no judgment of yourself. What about choose thee this day whom you will serve, Martin? Yes, you have a choice. Is there a choice here? Mm -hmm. No, they're not there. <laughs> <laughs> no choice whatsoever. Thirteenth rule. To be right in everything, we are always to hold that the white which I see is black if the hierarchical church so decides it, believing that between Christ our Lord, the bridegroom, and the church his bride, there is the same Spirit which governs and directs us for the salvation of our souls. Because by the same Spirit and our Lord, who gave the Ten Commandments, our Holy Mother, the Church, is directed and governed. But those commandments have been changed in the Catechism, right? Yes. So which Lord gave them? Well, the enemy of God. You're right, Martin, because the Lord says, I change not. Hmm. I do not alter what went out of my mouth. But these people have a changed set of commandments, so which Lord then gave them that false set of commandments? That Lord of the earth. Which allows them mm -hmm. to venerate relics and images and all of these things. Now, when you internalize that in your imagination mm -hmm. and you eventually get to the point where you physically, in your imagination have contact with that world, you're part of the occult world. Yes. 
because Satan sits behind all of this. Correct. So the Jesuits have to obey Perin de a cadaver, like a corpse. Loyola wrote, even if God gave you an animal without sense as a master, you will not hesitate to obey him as master and guide, because God ordained it to be so. The constitutions repeat 500 times that one must see Christ in the person of the general. So you have the white pope and you have the black, black pope. pope. That's yin yang. That's Eastern mysticism. So modern these exercises. Now we could go into greater details because when he talks about visualization, mm. he says you must use all the senses. Yes. All of them. All five senses. So when you visualize that you are, let's say, in the presence of Christ, or in the presence of Mary, his mother. You must see her with a spiritual imagination. Mm -hmm. You must smell her. You must touch her. You must hear her. So that apparition that you imagine becomes a reality because you have incorporated mm -hmm. her into your senses. And then when she speaks to you, that becomes the word of God. <laughs> And you must listen to it. But have you tested that spirit? When no. it tells you you can change the commandments of God? No. No. So this kind of training is alive and well. Yes. And has infiltrated the entire world. Correct. Protestant churches have put Correct. a Christian label on this. Absolutely. So today we have Ignatian retreats all over the world. And as we have seen... You have to do this on mm. an annual basis in some form or another. And the Jesuits have infiltrated Protestantism and brought this Ignatian spirituality into the churches without them knowing it. Correct. So Ignatian retreats and spiritual exercises, an eight-day Ignatian retreat for priests, religious deacons, lay ministers by Thomas Roach, Society of Jesus, uses contemplation and themes of spiritual exercises and other meditations to guide the reader prayerfully into the heart of an Ignatian retreat. And basically, how do you serve? Serve what? The interests of the church. Correct. Here's another one, the Jesuit Review. You can download the spiritual exercises from this website. So the first installment of Jesuit Review offers an introduction to the spiritual exercises and uh, you, know, you, can, you can read it there. Together with Father Joseph Tetloff, Society of Jesus, and he writes, Philosophy continues at the heart of the Jesuit liberal arts curriculum because more than any other discipline, it can provoke the intellectual conversion of the conventional thinker to the principal reflection. Uh, what did Martin Luther say in those quotes in the beginning? What is the value of this according to Martin Luther? Nothing. Zero. Nothing. No value whatsoever. It might be of some value in the temporal world. Yes. It might be important for the world and for the, the, the way people view you but it's got zero value with God with God exactly the same as those those important names that meant nothing exactly. in the eyes of God here's a quote from Richard M Gula Jesuit of course and professor our own Jordan experience must be the keystone experience for measuring all other experiences as being experiences of God it requires such discipline as a continuous rhythm of prayer, leisure, silence, exercise to nurture physical and emotional health and other spiritual exercises such as spiritual direction, dream work, fasting and whatever else enables us to unlock our imaginations and to let go of those paralyzing attachments which prevent us from being aware of God's presence in our lives 
and from bringing our lives into the drift of our deepest desires. The judgment of which the process of discernment leads will be as true for us as the freedom with which we make it. Now, Martin, there is not one ounce, mm -hmm. not one nanogram of biblical spirituality in that statement. No. So where do you get your discernment from? Where do you get your information from as to what the will of God is? Well, from your inner self. And that is being fueled by demonic spirits, to put it bluntly. Mm. How do we know it's demonic? Because they change the word of God. So Martin, now that we've seen what the basis of Ignatian spirituality is, and what fuels the morality of mm. Pope Francis, which in turn fuels the morality of the world, yes. which in turn will be incorporated in legislation. Do you, as a Bible-believing person, want to be part of that spirituality? No. Would definitely you, like not. Martin Luther, say it is time to speak? Yes, definitely. And it's important because this, like you mentioned earlier, has infiltrated churches, Absolutely. Protestant everywhere. All of the things, the retreats that the churches have, they're based on Ignatian spirituality. When you look at the structures that they have, even in uh, courses like the Alpha Course and all of those, they're all steeped with Ignatian spirituality. And when you start candle rituals and contemplations mm -hmm. and all of these and bringing in Eastern mysticism. Yes, because now you've got Christian yoga. Yes. All of this links in to all this false spirituality. Yes, and people are being sucked into it. And there will have to come a very clear divide between those who find this information, this word of God, precious, mm -hmm. and those who don't. You know, Martin, before I end, let me just go, if you don't mind. No, I just really never mind off the cuff. Go into the Bible. Go there. <laughs> go to the very first psalm in the Bible. There's a reason why that psalm is the first psalm, by the way. It's a very short psalm, mm. but it sets, sets the stage. In fact, the, very, the first two psalms set the the stage for the entire book of Psalms, which was the hymnal of the Hebrews. This is what they sang. Mm -hmm. And you know, the hymnal of the, re of the Hebrews and the words that they entail are so full of meaning and depth. That's where you get your spirituality, right? Yes. And uh, I know that this is not part of the discussion, but just as a counter to all of this that we've Correct. seen. Let's just look this at this. This is where you get that spirituality from. Yes. Psalms 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. This is where I get my spirituality. Now, Martin, look at that first verse. Blessed is the man that walketh mm -hmm. not in the council, nor standeth in the way of the sinner, nor sitteth. There's a progression. Mm -hmm. There's a progression from walking standing. to standing to sitting. So when you walk with the wicked, eventually you will stop Stand. and start talking to them. Mm -hmm. And eventually you will sit with them. Yes. And uh, eventually you might actually become a chairman sitting on a chair. Now, in uh, Afrikaans, you are Afrikaans, mm -hmm. the word chairman in Afrikaans is voorzitter. Yes. Did S you get that? Voorzitter. Voor is in front. the front. 
And sitting. a sitter is someone who sits. Sitting in front. So the f- sitting in front, the one who controls the issue. So Martin, when you start walking in the counsel of the ungodly, in other words, those that do not take their spirituality from this book but from another source, eventually you will stand and talk to them. Yes. And eventually you will sit down with them. Mm-hmm. Then you're sitting in the ecumenical council. Councils. What if you become a chairperson in one of their councils? Then you've got a problem. You have a major problem, right? Correct. Then you have been swallowed hook, line, and sinker. Beware, lest we walk that road. But our delight should be in the law of the Lord, and in his law does he meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. This is the exact opposite Mm -hmm. of Ignatian spirituality. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. So this psalm sets the tone. Don't walk with them. Don't stand, don't stand with them. And don't, don't sit, sit with them. It's a progression. Yes. And stick to the Bible, the Torah, the law of God, the law and the prophets. And then you'll be like a tree planted. And the second psalm, tells us around whom our spirituality should resolve. Not some earthly imposter who gets his spirituality from a non-biblical source. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, saying, Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. So they feel there's something in God's word that is holding them back. Mm. Yeah. And that's the law of God. Correct. Let's break those cords. Let do what thou wilt be the whole of the law. Yeah. Isn't that what they're saying? Yes, because the law is a burden. Yeah, so let us break their bands asunder. Cast away their cords from us and let us get our spirituality from another source Mm. by our imagination and not by the word of God. The inner one. He that sitteth in heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet, and now listen to this, yet have I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Who's the real king, Martin? Jesus. Jesus. Not some earthly one that I set in his place. Mm -mm. Right? Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. That's a messianic promise. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like the potter's vessel. Jesus will be the ultimate ruler. If you put your faith in an earthly one, you will be disappointed. Yes, including yourself. Including yourself. Be wise now, therefore, O ye kings, Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Ah, and in this verse, Martin, kiss the Son with a capital S, lest he be angry and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put his trust in him. Martin, As for me and my house, I want to follow that. You know what? Don't go and sit and try to smell and touch and do all these things. No. Open this word. Read through it. And that's where your spirituality comes from. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
What a contrast. What a plot to dethrone the King of Heaven. Lord, let us kiss the Son, lest we perish. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching this video. To subscribe, click here. When the bell appears, click again to get notifications. To watch the next video, click here. Thank you.